Welcome. I'm Kathy Fredrickson, and I'm the Director of Collections and Curatorial Affairs here at the museum. And I'm happy to welcome you all to uh, the 37th Ray Cow Commission. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, this is the commission that is awarded annually to an emerging or established artist who is not yet represented in our collection. Uh, and what we, what we aspire to do is to encourage artists to venture into new areas that they might not otherwise be able to explore because of financial limitation. Uh, it was inaugurated in 1986, and it's made possible through the generosity of the late Dr. Len and Mrs. Leonard S. Raykow. Each commissioned work is added to the museum's permanent collection and goes on view in our galleries. And after uh, Charisse's presentation, we will go and take a look at the work. Uh, it's an honor for me to introduce the 37th Raykow Commission artist, Charisse Perlina Weston. Charisse is a conceptual artist and writer whose practice in gr is grounded in a deep material investigation of poetics and the autobiographical in the service of black people. Her first solo museum show, Of a Tomorrow, Lighter Than Air, Stronger Than Whiskey, Cheaper Than Dust, recently closed at the Queens Museum in New York. Charisse came to the attention of former curator of contemporary art, Susie Silbert, in 2020 when she was selected for inclusion in our International Survey of Contemporary Artists, New Glass Review 41. Uh, this is an annual exhibition in print that features a hundred of the most timely, innovative projects in glass produced each year. It is an honor to include in our collection her vital, responsive work to appear before the first beat of unwilling end, anacrusis, important both for the cultural moment it grapples with and for its unique manipulation of the translucent properties of glass. Charisse has an amazing CV. I can't even cover it all here. She has a BA from the University of North Texas, a Master's of Science in Modern Art, History, Curating, and Criticism from the University of Edinburgh's Edinburgh College of Art, and an MFA in Studio Art with Critical Theory Emphasis from the University of California, Irvine. She's an alumna of the Whitney Museum of American Arts Independent Study Program. Charisse was named a Studio Museum Harlem 2022-23 Artist in Residence, a 2023 Jerome Hill Fellow, and will be a 2023 Hotter Fellow of the Lewis Center for Arts at Princeton University. She has exhibited in group shows at the Contemporary Art Museum Houston, Jack Shanman Galleries, The School, and the acclaimed group show Black Melancholia presented at the, by the Hessel Museum of Art at Bard College. She's mounted numerous solo exhibitions and was a 2021 Artist Fellow at the Museum of Art and Design, where she was also awarded the 2021 Burke Prize. She was recently a Paul and Irene Hollister Fields of the Future Fellow at Bard Graduate Center. Her hybrid manuscript, Awaiting, will be published by Ugly Duckling Press this month. Tonight, we celebrate the groundbreaking edition of Charisse's Raycow Commission to our growing collection of contemporary works of art at the Corning Museum of Glass. Her experimentation and investigation into materiality helps us see and understand glass in new ways. So please join me in welcoming Charisse Perlina Weston. Thank you, Kathy, and everyone here at um, the Corning Museum. Um, I'm gonna try not to be like super nervous at the very start. Um, so I will just uh, jump in. Um, so I'll begin with, with two quotes. Um, 
The first by um, the amazing writer Dionne Brand from her book, A Map to the Door of No Return, in which she writes, quote, black experience in any modern city or town in the Americas is a haunting. And the second is from the scholar Catherine McKittrick um, from her book, Demonic Grounds, Black Women and the Cartographies of Struggle, in which she writes, the spatial dilemma between memory and forgetfulness produces what has been called a black absented presence. Absented presence is evident in several black and black feminist narratives that outline how processes of displacement erase histories and geographies, which are in fact present, legitimate, and experiential. The site of memory then suggests that erasure is lived and livable through the past and the present. The site of memory displays and utters new sites of being and a different sense of place as they are embedded with forgetfulness. And so I'm beginning with these two quotes because they really characterize some of the central themes and questions which motivate my practice right now. That is to say that they highlight the ways in which the structures we live in or those which we have demolished and have built over hold the histories, protocols, and atrocities of, uh, and atrocities of our nation's socio-political legacy in their marrow. They haunt, they reel, they seize. They disorder the, the spaces around us. They peel our skin. So how to contend with this thing called home, city, nation, world that is violent and yet innermost, familial, in the same instance? In thinking about these quest that question in particular, my work examines black interior life, resistance, and technologies of surveillance, encompassing both the physical apparatuses um, that make up technolo these technologies, such as architecture, for example, and ideological ones, such as media, laws, policies. These technologies work to reify anti-blackness. I interrogate first how these mechanisms employ socio-spatial proximity to manifest a restrictive form of intimacy, and second, how this intimacy enacts violence. I contend with this dynamic interplay of violence and intimacy with what I, what I term tactics of black refusal. Thus, my work emerges from deep material investigations of the symbolic and literal folds, layerings, and collapses of space, poetics, and the autobiographical. Interweaving glass sculpture, sound, video, and photography, as well as text, I explore how practices of repetition, enfoldment, concealment, and delay can rearticulate intimacy in black interiors as sites of resistance. So oftentimes I build from the historical in order to expand out into a critique of the contemporary. And this approach is informed by the legacy of W.E.B. Du Bois's formulation of a radical historiography in which not only, uh, which not only questioned the supposed objectiveness of historic writing and its relation to race, but also announced the need to determine methods for critically engaging the past, particularly that of black people in the present and beyond. For example, my first solo museum exhibition, which um, as Kathy mentioned, just closed a few weeks ago, um, which was also entitled Of a Tomorrow, Lighter Than Air, Stronger Than Whiskey, Cheaper Than Dust, directly engaged the unique socio-spatial history of Flushing Meadows Corona Park in Queens, New York. The site of what is now Flushing Meadows Park and the Queens Museum has a complex history. It was used um, in the early years of the, the 20th century as an ash dump and was so infamous that it was referenced in F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. Um, later, Robert Moses, whose 
Urban planning projects transform the infrastructural landscape of New York City and the field of urban planning across the United States, proposed to turn that site into a park um, in the 1920s. And a portion of it was transformed um, for the, uh, transformed in time for the 1939 World's Fair. Many of Moses' projects were to the detriment of black neighborhoods that were purposefully not given access to the parks, public swimming pools, and other public amenities that he championed. Moses' vision for Flushing Meadows Park was later renovated, um, or rather I should say, expanded upon and completed in anticipation of another World's Fair that took place at that site, um, the 1964 World's Fair. Um, and this fair in particular was theme thematized around ideas of the future and the New York State P Fair Pavilion, which was constructed by the controversial architect Philip Johnson, featured a component aptly titled The Tent of Tomorrow. Um, which you can see here. Um, and this structure uh, was made of concrete and features, features the world's largest suspension roof, a series of colorful plexiglass panels, and a terrazzo floor map of New York State sponsored by Texaco, which was likely a nod to Moses' sprawling impact on the city um, and the state of New York. Um, for those who aren't aware, Johnson was one of, at one point, one of the most important um, and influential figures in American architecture, having served as the first curator of architecture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, the skyscrapers that he developed uh, through his architecture for, firm transformed the cityscapes of major cities across the United States. Johnson was also, um, and this was fairly well known throughout his career, and a, an unwavering Nazi supporter and anti-Semite his entire life. He visited Germany several times during World War II, repeatedly made attempts to meet Hitler, and distributed Nazi propaganda in the United States upon his return. Later in life, he continued, whether consciously or unconsciously, to support the work of key figures of the Third Reich, including Nazi architect Albert Speer, who was also a fan of Johnson's work. And so here's another view of the Tent of Tomorrow. And the Terrazzo Four of the Tent of Tomorrow. So just um, a few weeks Ahead of its opening on April 4th, 1964, the Brooklyn and Bronx branches of the Congress for, of Racial Equality, also known as CORE, then led by Brooklyn Chairman Isaiah Brunson, announced their intent to stall hundreds of cars along the access roads and highways leading to the 1964 World's Fair. This proposed gesture of resistance meant to represent the ways in which white supremacy prohibits black life, was met with immediate widespread backlash from media outlets, government officials, and other civil rights activists. Then New York City Mayor Robert F. Wagner Jr. declared the activists had placed a gun to the heart of the city. Both the Bronx and Brooklyn chapters um, were soon expelled by the National Corps Chairman, um, James Farmer, who later staged a counter protest to the Stalin in the form of a picket on the day of the fair. So here you see on the left two posters, one from um, announcing the intendant Stalin and the other announcing the uh, more traditional picket which took place um, and was organized by the National Corps chapter. Um, and I kind of like to put these two, two posters, these two archival uh, documents together as a way to kind of think about the ways in which both of these uh, protests were really asking for and demanding the same things, but were considered to be so vastly different.
although the Stalin was met with enormous local and national opposition that ultimately prevented it from taking place as originally conceived, CORE was successful in disrupting, even if only temporarily, the fair and the city's psychological landscape. The tens of thousands of would-be fairgoers who had come to the world of fantasy were instead made to encounter the world of fact. So you're probably wondering why, why am I giving you all of this like backstory? Um, and so this is all of the information that I kind of was navigating as I was preparing to do uh, this exhibition at the Queen's Museum. Um, and with all this in mind, I began to explore and really think about the ways in which an engagement with CORE's history could first invert the structures of Johnson and Moses' projects and legacies grounded in white supremacy, and second, consider the ways in which the architectures of the city inscribe fantasies of futurity, freedom, and intimacy. And then third, disorder the ways in which these inscriptions worry black life. And so where I landed was this exhibition, uh, which was split, split across two galleries. And in the first, I presented a large-scale spatial intervention. Um, this piece, uh, which had the same name as the show, um, is comprised of six large-scale glass panels, which joined to create a surface area of approximately 15 feet by 20 feet. It's suspended at a height of approximately 12 feet at its highest, um, and one edge of the work slopes toward the exit of the gallery. This sloped, suspended um, glass piece blocks passage from one end of the gallery to the next, prompting consideration of how architecture acts as a spatial and social modifier, which redefines ideas of the future and freedom. So through this gesture, um, this work takes on the radicality of CORE's threat to stall, to pause, and to withhold passage through, while also considering what this gesture can provide within the context of black spatiality and intimate terrains. Furthermore, it disrupts ideas of the future and nationhood articulated, for example, within Philip Johnson's New York State Pavilion, and particularly the component entitled The Tent of Tomorrow, as well as Robert Moses' infrastructural fantasies and realized projects which purposefully left black communities underdeveloped. By withholding passage through, this gesture metaphorically obstructs access into the anti-black territory territories approved and promoted by Johnson and Moses, um, which are alive and present, and which continue to delimit and erase black presence. Positioned adjacent to the installation, the photographic diptych on canvas, This World's in a Tangle, got news this morning, was etched with broken glass from past work. It combines a prior autobiographical copper etching with a map of the counter protest to the Stalin, as I mentioned, which was staged by CORE's national chairman. And so here is um, an image that I found in an archival issue of the New York Times from April, 20, April 21st. 1964, which depicts a member of the National Corps branch um, marking locations for their protest. Um, and so I used elements of this map as the basis for the diptych that I just shared with you. These opposing visions of protest an immobilizing highway blockade in contrast with National Corps' more traditional picket of several pavilions converged through the reflection and inversion of the diptych on the surface of, of a tomorrow. The reflection of this map acts as another disruption of Johnson's uh, New York State Pavilion, where instead of the map being on the ground, corporate-sponsored and representative of New York State, 
it is inverted onto the surface of this suspended piece and through its refle reflection is expanding, um, sorry, it re expands the mapping of black protest and resistance. And here is a detailed view of some of the etchings. Within my work, I use glass to conceptually embody both the everyday risk of anti-black violence and the precocity and malleability of blackness in the face of this violence. Through balancing and hot folding by hand, I imbue an atmosphere of risk and precarity within my work um, that represents the anxiety of black experience in the United States. My formal explorations of this material theorize its folds and layers as terrains constitutive of interiors and exteriors which articulate the complexities of black intimacies and the refusal at times to be revealed. Because I view all violence as concerned with a certain kind of intimacy which, which exerts power through proximity and assumption, I ask, how can one resist the intimate pursuits of violence without foreclosing the delicate interior poetics of black life? I propose the fold, the curl, the layer, with its secret spaces of withholding as a tactical response. In works like this from the 2019 series Meta Narratives, I etched poems derived from fragments of archival material, um, in this case, uh, David Walker's An Appeal in Four Articles, which was published in 1829, and Frederick Douglass's famous speech, The Meaning of the Fourth of July for the Negro, which was given in 1852. Um, and so these components, which kind of build out into their own poems um, are etched onto the surface of glass panels um, placed alongside abstract photographs of which I term contested la uh, landscapes. And I refer to them as contested in the sense that um, in these images it represents parts of the city um, that I was living in at the time, which was Houston, Texas. Um, which were being gentrified and were subject to urban beautification projects. So I took all of these elements together and then enfolded the glass onto itself. Within this series, which was made alongside a four-channel sound installation, I collapsed the spatio-temporal boundaries of Walker and Douglas's mutual critique of American Enlightenment ideals by inserting my own textual interpretation. I used enfoldment and layering to articulate the ways in which blackness and the history of modern slavery disorients and puts pressure on concepts of freedom, property, and personhood. This series um, explores uh, the productive, or continues to explore and build upon um, my earlier explorations of the fold, um, and it investigates the productive po possibilities of concealment through the intersection of text and enfoldment. Um, in the following sculptures that I, I'm about to show, um, they represent my initial formulations of what is now my current research into the use of glass and technologies of surveillance. In this instance, I used um, the broken window theory as a starting point. Um, and this theory posited that dilapidated buildings and the presence of outsiders to a community represented um, and would result in crime and disorder. Um, the theory first appeared in uh, the 1982 essay, Broken Windows, The Police and Neighborhood Safety, which was written by sociologists James Q. Wilson and George Kelling. Um, and soon after its publication, it was quickly taken up by politicians and government officials in New York City and elsewhere as a means by which to justify harsh policing policies and increased uh, police presence in black and brown neighborhoods. 
while it contributed to the increased incarceration of black people, the theory and the policies which developed from it had no discernible impact on crime. So I should also mention that through this theory, the image of the broken window, a symbol of social unrest, transmits to the skin, to black presence. These works contend with this worrisome history through abstraction. Text exploring intimacy, power, and resistance is etched onto the surface of the glass panels that are then folded onto themselves to conceal, to withhold access to the interior. In these works, I'm privileging opacity in the poetics of the text, its placement, and the form of the the sculptures themselves as a way to challenge the ways in which transparency reduces and contrives. The transparent is what Edward Glissant describes as a requirement, quote, for the process of understanding people and ideas from the perspective of Western thought, end quote. Concepts like the broken window theory are predicated on the view, on this specific view of transparency. The theory gained immense popularity precisely because it was able to transform individuals who are already dubbed outside the boundaries of society into the movable markers of danger. It justified what was already known or felt about them. For example, in, the, um, in this, uh, the essay that the theory comes from, the authors wrote, quote, the unchecked panhandler is in effect the first broken window. End quote. In contrast, opacities can coexist and converge, weaving fabrics wherein to understand them, one must focus on the texture of the weave and not on the nature of its components, according to Glissant. So in these works, um, and really throughout my practice, I'm interested in using instances of repetition, layering, and enfoldment as mechanism, mechanisms which resist the ways in which glass is de deployed to symbolically and materially enact violence, um, sorry, to enact an a violent proximity to the interior. In these, these works, text flows over and under, disappears beneath its curl, and reappears with power in its fragmentation. In more recent sculptures, um, I'm further probing the disruptive, impervious possibilities of the fold through the incorporation of archival photographs and media coverage of black protests across history. I am specifically mining these archives as a way to examine how anti-black representations of black protest um, and black presence inscribed by concepts like the broken window theory translate into coverage of black resistance wherein damaged property and broken storefront windows seem to have more value than black life. The photographic decal central to this um, sculpture was taken from Life Magazine's coverage of the 1965 Watts riots in Los Angeles, California. The image is disordered by a reorientation and breaking apart of the picture, play, picture plane where a protester, instead of being pressed onto the ground, lifts away from his antagonizers. For some of these works, I use lead as their base because of its relationship to the history of glass architecture in particular, um, as well as regi residential architecture. Um, I was also interested in its capacity for enfoldment and manipulation. Inside some of these folded leads, 
sculptures, I've etched fragments of texts that are fully concealed. An element of this work um, collapsed during the course of its exhibition with its shattered component then echoing the fractured glass depicted on the remaining original curved pane, an image from the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests. Later, a new panel and lead base was installed alongside the broken components. I locate black resistance in the repetition of forms and folds, as well as in the safeguarding of materials to formulate new work. The unpredictability and generative capacity of collapse within my installations destabilizes anti-black representations of black presence. Through these methods of black refusal, these sculptures disrupt the protocols and technologies of anti-blackness outlined. So in some of these pieces, um, I looked to the Queens Museum's archive, um, and some of the images are from a series of negatives that I found that are kind of like embedded deep within the museum's archive. And so that includes this piece here. Which depicts a protester being lifted up, and she's holding a um, a picket sign that says, remember Medgar Evers, a real American hero. In some of these pieces, particularly the ones that depict um, or pull from images from the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests, um, I chose to explode the image out and as deeply into abstraction as possible as a way to resist um, the tendency towards media coverage to, to lean towards images that, that display black people in suffering, black people being, being hurt. So this piece um, was quite different than um, all of the other pieces in this exhibition or in this series in particular, in that it contrasts um, these images of black protests with those, with um, a series of images that I found um, depicting the January 6th ins insurgency. Um, and this is part of a component of this, this uh, research that I've been doing where I've been looking also at the ways in which public actions in support of white supremacy are covered and represented in the media if they're covered at all. So this inclusion and juxta juxtaposition of archival material is meant to showcase the ways in which media coverage of black protests, as I mentioned, oftentimes focuses on broken windows and damaged property and is therefore an extension of the anti-black rhetoric that continues to justify black, um, anti-black um, police policies, police brutality, um, et cetera. And so this um, piece consists of two panels. One, the front panel um, is etched in the center and on, the, on its edge, the curl of one of its edges. And then on the other side, you can see this kind of layering of images. The historical artifacts uh, and events I examine reveal the ways in which, under the current symbolic order, the position of the black subject unjustly translates and transmits from person to property and from freedom to captivity. 
as a means to highlight and disorder this transmutation. I engage in metonymic acts of reuse and rearticulation by employing the same materials, such as photographs, texts, or broken glass, from prior work to formulate the next. For example, this installation rearticulates a prior glass installation from 2016. Um, it features a fragmented poem exploring mourning, time, and memory, printed on vellum as well as etched on slumped glass. The text is situated atop and beneath photographs which have been burned onto the surface of glass panels. For this version of uh, this piece, I reworked the original text and added a series of photographic glass sculptures. The installation is supported by a series of handmade wooden benches produced by my father, Robert Western Sr. And this is a reference to a prior collaboration in which he also produced a series of benches very similar to these. Taken together, this installation uses instances of repetition, enfoldment, and opacity to explore the interstices of black intimacies, loss, and historicity. And so I, so here is an excerpt from the 2022 text, which as I mentioned was reworked. Um, using the original text, um, and so I'll just read the first stanza. I cried into a body gone to flesh, then into its gone flesh, then into its barrenness, nestled within its still life, sliding along the translucence of the sclera. I cried into an overflow, into my mother's overburden, into my mother's resistance, then and now, to mourn for the dream. And here is the original text from 2016. Um, and again, I'll just read the first stanza. I cried into the body of a someone gone in another way, a someone presently behind my eyes, my retina, who is as translucent as the one my mother was, then and now, in resistance to mourn. Through the use of text in my work, I consider the ways in which the symbolic realm of language delimits and fortifies the justification and reproduction of systemic anti-blackness. I use semi-autobiographical poetic fragments intertwined with fictional or historical texts to reimagine and posit black interior life as a central site of black resistance. I predicate my exploration of language on the belief that within the in infinite opaqueness and liquidity of a poetics emerging from blackness, words shatter, phrases fragment, and meaning slips. And it's this entropic capacity of language which ruptures the boundaries of established meaning and dominant thought, which reinforce systems of oppression. And so this photographic series of which you saw um, in the beginning, a the diptych was, is a part of. Um, this is a series that I started in um, 2017, um, in which I began by looking at photographic documentation of past glass installations, um, rendered it black and white, printed them on canvas, and then etched into them using the shattered glass from those same um, collapsed installations. The titles of these works are derived from um, blues and gospel songs. Originally, um, they all came from this now defunct Houston record label called Peacock Records, uh, which, emerged, uh, which merged with the famous blues label Duke Records in the 1950s. Um, and I should say, this kind of reference to this record label is kind of my way of uh, 
paying homage to the impact that blues has in my work and the way that I think about my practice. see the image or now? Oh, there it is. So um, my interest in use of repetition as a methodology within this work is not meant to be a, rec a recuperation or a seizure of the past, but instead an attempt at an otherwise analogous to the slipped pleasure of a blues moan that refuses to be held in. Through these recurrences, I build my own unique archive of materials which, coupled with the various methods of enfoldment, which I illuminated earlier, develop into new forms that represent the ways in which repetition is both a symbol of black cultural production and its reliance on an order of temporal engagement in which the second time encodes an emergent originality. Thank you. I don't know if this mic is on. Oh, it is. Oh, that's excellent. Um, so we're going to open it up for questions. If anybody has any questions for Sharice about her work, um, we have mics here. Couple questions. Uh, first question is uh, regarding the tax on the glass. I, I see a little image of the work by Mr. Glenn Ligon. Uh, I was wondering if you draw any inspiration from his work. His work seems to be a little bit more contrast, mm -hmm. a little bit more repetitive. And I was just wondering your thought on that. And another question that I have is uh, going beyond the boundary of color, have you thought about using a colorless media such as glass, which without the traditional color that you have shown us tonight. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's funny that you mentioned Glenn Ligon, because he was, I saw the first time I ever went to a museum. Um, it was the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, and they had this exhibition, solo exhibition of Glenn Ligon. And I was just like, whoa, you can have a show that's just all text? What? Um, and it was just really amazing and impactful, and I think it opened my mind so much to like what art could be. And this was like in high school, and yeah. So he's a huge, huge inspiration. I think about his work quite a bit. Um, in terms of color, I usually kind of stick within like the same set of colors with with the work that I'm I'm doing. Although I've kind of moved into Clear glass, I use it every once in a while, but not as often. Um, but yeah, I kind of like s sit in this very specific wheelhouse in terms of color. I've, I've stepped out every once in a while, but I usually kind of gravitate to a certain set of, it, of colors. Sharice, I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm really fascinated by that the way that you use t text in your titling and um, a sort of deliberate uh, subversion of like traditional, you know, capitalization or, and it's something I see a lot in contemporary art now, um, can, you know, and in the work that we have acquired here for the Ray Cow Commission. Can you speak to that? What, what, what are you thinking about when you're making these titling choices? and? Uh, and even the way that you punctuate and the way that you capitalize the type. Yeah, um, I think really a lot of what I'm interested in is um, poetics in a broad sense, poetry, the opacity that's built into poetry as a field. Um, there's this really amazing quote by the um, 
late activist and, and writer, Tony K. Bambara, um, in which she talks about um, trying to do justice to the realm of reality that we all live in but can't acknowledge or do not acknowledge. Um, and she mentions that the English language is mercantile business um, and not for the interior life. And that's always been something that I've thought about, especially in my relationship to language um, and writing of like, you know, kind of acknowledging the limits of representation, both in terms of language, but also, um, you know, within the field of, of contemporary art to do justice, to experience, to intimacy, to, to interior life. And so I, I use this kind of manipulation of, of a form both within the context of the sculptures themselves, but also within the language as a way to kind of speak to the complexities of, of black life and black experience. Thank you. Biggest influence someone I've actually met. Mm -hmm. um, this is going to sound really cheesy, but I take my parents are a big influence in the way that they've like approached. I mean, just yeah, they're they're a big influence. They're very they're they're not people who work in the arts or anything like that, but they're very creative in different ways and they kind of epitomize making a way out of no way. And I take a lot of, I think about that a lot in my work. Hi, uh, thank you so much. This was a really great talk. I, and, and I appreciate you giving it uh, to an almost entirely white audience. That's not a question, just a, just a comment. Um, uh, but I, I was really struck by, by the quote that you gave of speaking about um, the, I wrote it down here, so uh, uh, apologies. I, I, I was like Googling things because a lot of ideas came to mind. But you said this uh, quote of like black intimacies lost in historicity. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking in terms of uh, in, in terms of your poetic practice, the use of language, um, this sort of recent formulation by Mitya Cardenas uh, in um, Poetic Operations, which is about trans of color um, art, mm -hmm. uh, where, where she describes poetics as the, um, like, I, I think the quote is something like the visible meaning of matter and agency. Um, and so I'm thinking about sort of thinking about that in terms of poetics and, mm -hmm. and also thinking about what also strike me as references like uh, Sidia Hartman and Fred Moten, um, like Sidia Hartman writing about uh, in Venus in Two Acts, like, the, uh, like these absent black archives, right? Mm -hmm. the, the archive of slavery as absent bodies. And then of course, like Fred Moten's um, sense of fugit fugitivity, right? In the sense of, uh, um, uh, surrounding democracy's false image in, sor in order to unsettle it. Um, and so, so I'm, yeah, I'm just wondering how you square these sort of, these sort of influences and these ideas. Uh, or, I mean, I think the answer is, well, it's in my practice, right? But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about these questions of sort of the fugitive role, the, the action against, or, um, or trying to, trying to get out of what's being imposed from elsewhere. Um, the role of the archive, right, in the absent archive and that uh, things being lost in black historicity. Um, yeah, uh, so that's probably a lot, but uh, that's what uh, came to mind, so thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I think that that's something that I'm contending with or trying to contend with in the approaches that I take with my work. Um, I mentioned uh, the influence of Du Bois because he's really one of, you know, really an early figure who is thinking about this comp the complexity of like, a his like what history means. Is it this objective, you know, uh, 
space to think about the past. No, it's not. <laughs> um, and so how can we think about forms that can um, actually represent black, black history, black life, and things like that? Um, and of course, you know, folks like Saidiya Hartman and Fred Moten have like continued that work in such complex and meaningful, important ways. Um, and so they're, they're like huge influences on my practice. Um, and yeah, I think that that's, you know, in reading their work, it's, it's kind of what drives me to think about like what, what forms can really do justice to this, you know, what's, what's absented, what's, what slips out of, uh, out of view and sometimes slips out of view on purpose as a way to kind of, as a kind of fugitive act. Um, and I think that that's, you know, in reading their work and thinking, thinking, I guess trying to think alongside them in, within the context of like a creative field, I think that that's how I've arrived at this, you know, pursuing these acts of withholding of concealment as a means by which to kind of think about how generative the fugitive can be. And instead of trying to like reclaim what's been lost, you know, instead thinking about the, the, the tactics that black folks knew, use today that, that create other spaces, um, or I guess to kind of reference um, Cedric Johnson, create an instance of an otherwise. Thank you, this is really fascinating. And, and it's clear that words and images drive your work. Have you used sound, whether it's the spoken word, music, instrumental, singing, uh, natural sounds, or anything like that in helping you to define where you go with some of your art? Yeah, so I've, um, in one of the series that I showed, um, called Meta Narratives, there was a sound installation that I did alongside of it um, that kind of uses like field, field recordings, um, spoken, spoken text, spoken by me, um, and then like these kind of like chopped and screwed elements. Um, so yeah, sound is like a big part of my practice. Um, it shows up in different ways. I've been looking to kind of develop more projects where I'm using sound, but it, it's definitely a big driver in my work. Would you be so kind to enunciate your first name for me? I would appreciate you enlightening me. Sharice. Sharice. My name is Kyla Sotomayor, and I first want to thank you for representing the BIPOC community in a predominantly non-BIPOC community and audience. Um, I thank you for sharing um, things that we may not have had the information about um, had you not been here and given us this lecture tonight. I wanted to thank James because he took some of my, my things that I was going to talk about, so thank you. But um, I think it's important that we um, also be able to be educated and experience things that we may not have had the opportunity to experience. Um, in a, predominantly non-BIPOC community or a non-BIPOC audience. Um, I would love to have the opportunity to talk to you after. Um, yeah, I'm sure. a part of the um, Ithaca Educators community, and um, I'm not sure how long you would be in the area, but I would love to see you either be in our public school system or in our college system as well to come and visit. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. I, uh, I guess I had a, a curious kind of studio practice question. And in um, navigating the narrative and the conflation of histories, how, how do you navigate how the work changes and the glass changes in the firings and then how you treat those objects? Are they like a designed object or, or a refound object? that you're working with, um, with the text, I guess, embedded in that form. So how do I, so, sorry, can you? 
I guess um, the objects are so fluid and obviously so influenced by the atmosphere of the process mm -hmm. as well as um, your intention with uh, speaking about histories. How, how do you navigate, um, I guess, putting the work together and the, I guess the poetry of the, the object? Is it, is it very planned or is, it, um, is that part of the poetry as well, how, the, how they come out? I guess, sorry, yeah. very confident. No, 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 I got it. Um, yeah, I think, um, so I, I don't have any like formal glass training and so like kind of digging into the material and kind of experiencing the ways in which glass resists even what I plan <laughs> to happen has been built into like the process of, of how I, I go about thinking about um, certain pieces. So I usually start with like, sometimes it'll be a text component or I'll have this like kind of archival image. Um, and I know that I'm gonna use it in a piece somehow, but sometimes, you know, I'll say, oh, there's, this will be two panels. And then once I've done the fold or I've done the, the slump and everything, it might be categorically different than what I imagined. Um, and but for me that that instance is always really exciting because it's it's this kind of like precarity that's built in to the process that's really exciting um, and so sometimes you know certain elements will like shift into another piece or shift out um, so it's really organic and kind of fluid in some ways I do do oftentimes have a vision, but I let that vision, I'm open to it shifting and like, I guess, uh, yeah, being manipulated and reformed by the material itself. Okay. I'm being told <laughs> <laughs> to wrap it up. Um, and I believe that the plan now is that you all will join us up in the galleries to get a preview of Charisse's Raycal Commission work. And if you want to continue the conversation in that space with the work, we can take a little time to do that. Okay, Maria? Yeah. <laughs> We're ready. And thank you. Thank you.